Hi, I'm Doug Milne, a member of the crew of the Josiah White II Canal Boat, located in Hugh Moore Park in Easton, Pennsylvania, at the National Canal Museum. Today I'll be reading to you a chapter from Tales of the Towpath. When last we saw Finn, he had been able to spend a day attending the Franklin School. Today he's back on board the Belfast Queen with his father and his brother Colin. Let's see where they're headed. Chapter 21, High Society. The autumn harvest was at its peak and Freemansburg was a hub of activity. Farmers from all over Lower Saucon and Bethlehem townships brought wagon loads of fruit and vegetables to the canal for shipment to towns and cities along the Lehigh and Delaware canals. Father had arranged for the Belfast Queen to haul produce to Easton, which was only 10 miles away. I had been there many times, mostly on Sundays, when we worshipped at St. Bernard's Church, the only Catholic church in the Lehigh Valley. I had a friend in Easton named Jimmy Riley, who lived on the outskirts of the city and attended St. Bernard's School. When Jimmy's school day was over, he helped paint the office of the new Easton Daily Express on North 4th Street. The Daily Express was almost ready to begin publishing the city's only daily newspaper. Jimmy's bosses, Mr. Eichmann and Mr. Davis, were determined to make the Daily Express the best newspaper in the city. They even installed a telegraph machine on the third floor of the building to receive the latest news. No one else had one. We left Freemansburg on Friday morning at 9 o'clock, long after most of the other boats. The Belfast Queen was loaded with bushel upon bushel of apples and pears and peaches and tomatoes. Pumpkins and other large squashes covered a corner of the cargo area. There were sacks of cornmeal and Irish potatoes and jugs of apple cider. Crocks full of fresh cheese and butter were stored on the bottom of the boat where it was cooler. I never saw so much food. All of it would be sold in Easton, where there were several grocery businesses and a huge market house in Center Square. Farmers from all over eastern Pennsylvania sold crops there. The tow to Easton was easy and relaxing. The canal reflected the brilliant colors of the autumn leaves. Geese flew high above the Lehigh River in large V-shaped flocks, all heading in a southerly direction. I watched two boys set muskrat traps along the canal, hoping to catch some of the furry varmints that caused so many costly leaks. Each muskrat they caught would bring a bounty from the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company. We entered the river after dropping through Lock 46 at Hopesville. Conan and Rogan pulled us along the shoreline, but then had to be ferried across the river at Smith's Island, where the canal switched from one side of the river to the other. We pulled the boat across the river, met our mules on the other side, and continued to Easton. We passed three large iron furnaces built next to the canal at a little village called Glendon. Father said we'd be there again in three days to load the boat with iron pigs. We exited the canal at Lock 48 and entered the river one last time. We were just a stone's throw from Easton. I vaulted to the towpath to take the mules from Colin and unhitch them from the tow line. After Colin vaulted onto the boat, I walked the mules down the towpath and across the Third Street Bridge into Easton. Father and Colin pulled the Belfast Queen across the river and steered it into a basin where our cargo would be unloaded. The day went quickly. Workers from Mr. Drake's grocery business arrived to unload the produce. We finished at three o'clock. After that, Father and I walked into the city, him to do business, and me to see my friend Jimmy. Collins stayed with the boat and the mules. Easton was the largest town in the Lehigh Valley. It had more than 7,000 people, twice as many as Bethlehem and Allentown combined. If you added South Easton, there were more than 9,000 people. Places like Easton grow quickly, Father said, as we neared North 4th Street where the Daily Express was located. Businessmen build factories here because they can ship their products anywhere on the canals and roads. 
The factories need workers, and the workers need homes and places to shop. After a time, all that growth adds up, and you have a town. That's what happened here. I thought about that as we crossed North 4th Street. Easton sure was different than any place I had seen. There was great wealth and a different type of culture, a kind of life some people called high society. Why Easton was so important that Northampton County built its courthouse right in the middle of Center Square. On any weekday, you could see lawyers and politicians standing near the courthouse in their fancy pants and coats and tall hats. Some of them carried shiny wooden canes and held the arms of ladies who were dressed as finely as queens. And here we see an illustration of some high society folks dressed in their Sunday best. My thoughts were interrupted by a familiar voice. Finn! Finn Gorman! It was Jimmy Riley standing on the corner of North 4th and Church Streets before he went upstairs to paint the newspaper office. Father, can I stay with Jimmy while you're doing business, I asked. We'll probably walk around town when he's done with his job. Certainly, Finn, Father replied. Meet me at Center Square at 6 o'clock and we'll head back to the boat. We'll be sleeping in Easton tonight. Thank you, Father, I said, and I was off to see my friend. Jimmy, how are you? I yelled as I crossed North 4th Street. Finn, come on over. I had to dodge a couple of carriages and a coal wagon, but I finally got across the street. Jimmy shook my hand, and we spent the next several minutes catching up with each other's news. Jimmy was surprised that Father had bought a canal boat and that I was part of the crew. I wanted to know if there were any new stores to visit. There's a great new shop, Jimmy said. It's called Eschenbach and Brothers French Confectionery and Fancy Tea Cake Baker's Oyster and Ice Cream Saloon. What? I said. Well, don't repeat it. Just tell me what it is. It's a place where they sell fancy pastries and cakes and ice cream, Jimmy explained, and oysters. I knew oysters were something like river mussels, but I could not imagine why anyone would want to eat them with ice cream or fancy cakes. I liked ice cream all by itself. We'll walk there when I'm done cleaning the office, Jimmy said. I'll even buy us something. I helped Jimmy clean and we finished in less than one hour. Without blinking an eye, we ran down the steps and were off in search of the land of oysters and ice cream and fancy cakes. Jimmy, I said as we crossed North 4th Street, let's visit Eschenbach's a little later. I'd like to go to Zulik's music store to see if anyone is playing the piano. Okay, Jimmy replied, let's go. We raced down Church Street and were set to cross North 3rd Street when we almost ran into a herd of cows that were being driven through the middle of the city by two men and three boys. One of the boys appeared to be my age. As I was watching, the boy looked in my direction. I smiled and waved. Where are you going with those cows, I shouted. My pa and my uncle are taking them to New Jersey, he shouted back. We're going to swim them across the Delaware. You're going to do what, I shouted back. Swim them across the Delaware. The boy repeated. Come on with us if you don't believe me. Jimmy and I looked at each other. Music and ice cream could wait. This was too exciting to resist. We jumped into the middle of all the dust and commotion and introduced ourselves. I'm Finn Gorman and this is my friend Jimmy Riley. I yelled over the grunts and moos of the cows. What's your name? Samuel Miller, he said. I'm very pleased to meet you. Where do you live, Sam? I asked. Well, Pa and I and my brother Aaron live in Dutchtown, he said. You know, it's in West Easton, up near Bushkill Creek. My uncle Jacob and cousin David live in Buffalo, New York. They have a farm where they raise all these cows. How did these cows get here from Buffalo, I asked Sam. That's awful far away. Well, we walked them here, he answered. Pa and I drove to Buffalo in our wagon and then helped Uncle Jacob bring them down. We're taking them across the Delaware to be sold in New Jersey. They fetch a good price. That's our business, we're drovers. Sometimes we help Uncle Jacob, and sometimes we drive animals for local farmers. Other people in Dutchtown do it too. 
We dodged a few tails and horns to get closer to Sam. One of the dang cows stepped on my foot just as I was getting a good position. I winced. You have to keep your eye on them all the time, Sam told me as I hopped toward him. They don't know where they're going. It's up to me and my hickory stick to keep them in line. Jimmy and I made sure we stayed close to Sam once we reached him. One false move and I'd have my other foot squashed. I was amazed how only five people could keep a herd of more than 100 cows in such a tight group. Northampton County Courthouse was straight ahead of us. I saw some of the lawyers scurry toward the safety of the building. Farmers at the market house pulled their produce closer to their tents. Keep them moving down Northampton Street, Sam's father shouted. The river isn't far. Keep them moving or they'll eat the county's grass. Everyone in Center Square watched the spectacle as it paraded its way toward the broad Delaware. We passed Zulik's music store, but I couldn't see if anyone was playing the piano because my vision was blocked by cowheads bobbing up and down. We finally reached the Delaware River. Sam's father arranged to have a couple of men in boats swim the cows across the river. While we waited, we sat in the shade of a large sycamore tree and talked to Sam. I don't know anyone from Dutchtown, Jimmy told him. Where do you go to school? Well, I don't get to go to school too much because I'm always helping Pa, Sam said. Sometimes I get to go to the Easton Public School, but most of my learning is done at the Shoal. The what? I said. I don't know what that is. The Shoal is a German school run by my synagogue. I go there on weekends when I'm home. What's a synagogue? Jimmy asked. Poor Sam was getting asked a lot of questions. It's where I worship, Sam replied. I'm Jewish, just like a lot of other German people in Dutchtown. Well, I'd never met a Jewish person before, and neither had Jimmy. Sam told us some things about his religion, and we just figured it was another way for people to worship God. He told us some amazing stories about animal drives. One time, he and his pa were driving sheep from Buffalo to Easton, and they had to wait five days to cross the Susquehanna River because it was flooded. Sam said he and his pa had to keep an eye open for wolves while they took care of the sheep. We were becoming comfortable in the shade when Sam's father gave the order to continue. Samuel, the cows are going into the river, he shouted. It's time for us to cross the bridge. Here's a picture of Sam and one of his cows wearing a cowbell, getting ready to go into the river. The three of us got up and shook hands. I looked at the Delaware River and saw more than 100 cows swimming in water up to their necks. They kept their heads high and straight and moved their legs as fast as they could. They swam just like dogs. A boatman rowed a small skiff on each side of the herd to keep the cows from going into fast water where they might drown. I'd never seen anything like it. Sam and his relatives disappeared into the long covered bridge and Jimmy and I headed back up Northampton Street. Eschenbach's ice cream sounded even more delicious after our hot and dusty walk. We passed Zulik's music store and sure enough, there was a man sitting on a bench playing the most beautiful piano I had ever seen. We stopped and listened. That music sounds like it was written in heaven, I told Jimmy. It's a new piano, Finn, Jimmy said. I haven't seen that one before. What does that sign next to it say? Steinway, New York City, I replied. A piano made in New York City. I bet it was brought in here on the Morris Canal. A woman and young girl stood next to the piano. They seemed very interested. I'll bet that lady buys it, Jimmy said. But the sign says, $800, I replied. That's nothing for some people in this city, Jimmy said. How much do you think those homes on North 3rd Street cost? If they can afford those homes, they can sure afford a piano. Jimmy was right. As soon as the man finished playing the piano, the woman shook his hand and reached into a small purse. I knew it. She's buying that Steinway piano from New York City. Wouldn't it be grand for us to have something like that, Finn? I agreed, but I also knew that it wasn't likely to happen 
unless we became rich like the high society people of Easton. We continued on Northampton Street past Center Square and finally arrived at Eschenbach and Brothers French Confectionery and Fancy Tea Cake Bakers Oyster and Ice Cream Saloon. I stared at the fancy lettering on the store window. Everything about the place seemed magical. What are you waiting for, Finn? Jimmy asked. Let's go in. I felt awkward not having any money, but Jimmy really wanted a treat, so I asked for one scoop of vanilla. Take two, Jimmy insisted. It's on me. Our cold, sweet ice cream was gone all too soon. Before I knew, it was time to meet Father in Center Square. As I walked back with Jimmy, I glimpsed over my shoulder and saw the college called Lafayette overlooking the Delaware River. We passed Bixler's jewelry store and marveled at the pr precious gems on display inside. House after house had beautiful windows of colored glass and doors with shiny brass hinges and knobs. As we approached Center Square, I saw a man with a long pole lighting gas lamps that surrounded the courthouse. The bluish-yellow flames flickered slowly before they finally burst into a bright white light. Then I saw Father patiently waiting for me in front of White's Hotel. It had been a fine afternoon, and I told Jimmy exactly that. We shook hands, and Jimmy headed back up Northampton Street to his home on the west side of Easton. On the way to the Belfast Queen, I told Father all about my day. Colin was waiting for us, patiently rubbing his new shoes with linseed oil. I walked onto the deck and went into the cabin. That night, I dreamed of sharing vanilla ice cream with Jenny Geisinger at Eschenbach and Brothers French Confectionery and Fancy Tea Cake Bakers Oyster and Ice Cream Saloon. I hoped someday my dream would come true. Well, that's it for chapter 21. Join us again next time for chapter 22. I think Finn might make a new friend in that one. Hope you're here for it. Thanks for joining us and take care.